Welcome to the selling show where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. global business celebrity, best-selling author, television and podcast host, part-time cowboy, the man, the myth, the legend, Jeffrey Hazlett is back. Welcome to The Selling Show. Thank you. I wish it was full-time cowboy. That's what I want. I'm still saving up money for a new tractor. You know, that's why I keep saying I'm to my wife, I want my tractor. I want a tractor. So that could be a full-time cowboy. That'd there be you awesome. go. You got yeah. the tractor, the horses, the farm, the whole deal. Yeah. Yep, got it all. Nice. You have a multifaceted empire here, the C-Suite Network. You've got a podcast network. You've got books out there. Let's start by talking about just the state of the union for the entrepreneurial expert, because obviously you are an entrepreneurial expert yourself with quite a large empire. What are you seeing out there as far as thought leadership with podcasts and books and speaking and What are macro trends? And then we'll dig in further. You know, David, we work with a lot of speakers. You're part of the Million Dollar Speakers Organization group that's part of the National Speaker Association. You know, and I keep telling people, I said, quit calling yourself a speaker, quit calling yourself a podcaster, quit calling yourself an author. Those aren't destinations, they're just tools. And I think that's the biggest thing that I see is that for thought leadership, it's really about your IP and your content, not about who you are, you know. And for most people, you're not going to make money being a speaker. You're not going to make money being a podcaster or television host or certainly not as an author, for the most part, if you really know the business. But you can use those tools. You can use that content. And in the context of how you use that content is how you really build your kingdom. You know, content's king, activation's queen, but context is the real kingdom of how you use that. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have found over the years. You know, COVID was a real pain in the you know what. I mean, it was for everybody. I don't care who it was. We retooled, we redid things. But, you know, like you, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I couldn't even sew a mask. So I had to be a business first responder. And the first thing I had to do was go triage my own business and make sure that I was going to survive and keep the people that are employed through us. So we did that. And then we retooled, found different ways to do it, you know, and COVID, you know, didn't cause the transformation for most of us on thought leadership to digital but it sure as hell accelerated it. And so, you know, for all of us, days became weeks, weeks became months, months became years. And so now we're in different models. And, you know, everybody keeps saying, well, it's going to snap back the way it used to be. No, it's not. It's never going to snap back, you know, no different than Kodak will never be, you know, in the film business again, right? So that's, I think the biggest thing is how to use and position content to drive your business. And not as a destination point, but really truly as a place for you to be able to, you know, gain greater discovery, gain greater reach, and gain greater conversion of whatever you're selling. Yes, absolutely. Now, talk a little bit just about your own adventures in this kind of post-pandemic world. Obviously, the podcast network is going great. Talk. Let's start there. Talk yeah. about C-Suite Radio and kind of where that has been and where that is going. Well, it just continues to be a trajectory up, up, up. You know, we're growing at about 170% a year and overall, you know, 400% in listeners, you know, more in, in revenue because we go out and aggregate all the podcasts together. So we have, you know, hundreds of podcasts. We're looking for more podcasts. If you have a podcast and you're not part of a network, well, then you're in podcast purgatory because you're out there slugging it out on your own. That doesn't mean you can't be successful at it. By all means, you can And for the most part, for a B2B podcaster, you pretty much just want to interview people that you want to do business with. And then if you can get famous and make money from it, well, that's a different thing. But really, it's a marketing thing. I was telling another person the other day that that's probably the biggest example of what I would say to people and and tell people is they interview the people you want to do business with. And someone said, well, geez, I'm closing 20, 30 percent of the people that I'm interviewing. How can I get more? I said, well, are you going to be more effective at sales? And they said, no, probably not. I said, well, it's probably true. You know, we can't take old dogs and teach them new tricks. You're going to do the same things no matter what we tell you, that that's unhealthy or healthy. You're going to do what you want to do with your life because that's where we're at. But if you want to increase more, do more shows. 
<laughs> That's it. Instead of doing yeah. one a week, do two a week, do three a week. And if you're closing 20, 30%, don't you think you'll close 20, 30% going forward, you know, on average? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's another way to do it. Or you get really effective at picking the people that you're doing interviews with and doing better at your follow up and your conversion. So, but we're seeing a great trend. You know, everybody keeps thinking, oh, podcasts, they're everywhere. We're, you know, we're mature. We're not even close to a mature market. There's going to be a million more. And not only that, most podcasts, David, they don't stick with it. They're not yes. like you. They're not like me. We've been on here for years. You know, I've been on here for, I think, seven years now doing a podcast or something close to it. But the, the issue that we see is that, you know, 48% of all podcasts never make it past 10. Never make yeah. it past 10. I think it's 38% or maybe it's the flip of that, or close to half, don't make it past the first year. So, you know, I always tell everybody that's thinking about doing a podcast, you know, first of all, realize why you're doing it. It's for fortune, not for fame. Second, and it's for positioning. Positioning is always good. It makes you the, it helps make you a thought leader. Look at it not as a destination, but as a tool, right? And then third, make sure you make a commitment to do it for at least a year. You know, absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. Well, talk a little bit. I want to back up because people listening might not even know what a podcast network is. Oh. So talk about what a podcast network is, how that works kind of behind the scenes a little bit. And then what does the host gain by being part of a you podcast bet. network? You know, when I first started podcasting, I was with CBS radio. So CBS asked me to be the business anchor. They had Jennifer Beale on the health side and Carson Daly on the pop side and Boomer Sison on the sports side. We were all the anchors of each of their verticals in those areas. And so I had the business side. They decided to get out of it. So we took it and said, okay, I'll take the shows who wants to come and, and start a network. And we started C-Suite Radio. So a network is no different than you see on Bloomberg or you see on NBC or see on NPR. They all have networks. We're a network just like them, and we're a podcast network. And so we host your podcast, okay? And then we go out and market you as a whole and market you individually. And so we show which shows are trending. You know, roughly it's 80 20 rule. 20% 20 of our podcasts bring us 80% of our listeners, you know? But on average, if you're with a network, your listenership goes up by about 40%. That's a fairly good norm. Plus, you know, with that network, we're also selling advertising across it so you can recoup the cost of your podcast. And if we can typically get you to about 2,500 downloads, okay, you'll start to make money on that podcast and you'll get ahead on it in terms of your, your investment. But that's the average business podcast, by the way, is about 2,500 per month. We see a lot greater than that because of the network effect. And I think you would agree, David, there is a network effect. When you surround yourself with billion-dollar companies or with great talent or great people, your boat floats with everybody else's. And that's really what it's about. Yeah. Let's go back to interviewing your prospects. Our prospects usually, like your guests, for example, are CEOs and high-level executives. They sometimes freak out. And I remember specifically being in your studio, because I was filming a segment on C-Suite TV, yeah. and we're in the green room. And so another CEO walks in, and he's got his COO, he's got his PR person, <laughs> he's got a yeah. big binder full of notes, they're prepping, they're having a little bit of a celebrity freakout moment, going to be, I'm going to be on with Jeffrey Hazlett, I got to make sure I say the right thing. So some of them are nervous. Some yep. of them are not regularly interviewed like you and I are regularly interviewed. Right. How do we put that person at ease? How do we get them to open up? You know, one of the things I tell them right before we get started, say, hey, my job isn't to embarrass you. My job is just to bring the story out. So let's have a good story. Let's talk. Let's have a good conversation. You know, my job isn't to get you or, you know, I gotcha. I'm not looking for those moments. I'm trying to make it as interesting as I can. And so they know that that's the case, at least on my show, I might say, come on, you know, give me the real story, whatever. You know, like the time I pushed uh, Balmer, Stephen Balmer, I said, how, he launched a big campaign. I said, how much did that cost? He said, I can't tell you that. I said, why? Don't you have to get somebody's permission? I thought you were the CEO. And he got ticked off. I said, you want me to call your mother? He goes, I'm a publicly traded company. I said, of all the more reasons why you should disclose it, because it's coming out next quarter anyway. So why don't you tell me? I said, was it, is it bigger than a bread box? He goes, what do you mean? And was it more than 100 million? He goes, yes. Was it more than 250 million? He goes, no. I said, so how tough was that, right? 
But anyway, the, you know, it's to get the story out. And it doesn't mean it's not going to have that give and take. And they should know that. They should look at it and follow it and so forth. But by and large, you're going to kind of run through with them like a, typically a pre-interview call. You know, my team has a pre-interview call with the my guest. I don't do that because I just like to do it. I look at the notes five minutes before I go on, maybe study a little bit more if I really don't know who they are. But as you know, I have fairly iconic people and I know most of them and or know about them. So I know where I want to go with the story. So I don't try to ask stupid questions, you know, like, tell me what you do. As I'm sure you and I have had those interviews with some people who who say, tell me about your background, Jeff. Well, come on, you know, those kind of things. But yeah, that's, that's how you best do it with, with folks and being able to do it. And again, getting back to this network effect, I mean, you become now a headliner in a network as opposed to just being XYZ podcast show, one of millions. You're an elite number of people. It's like no different than me being a Fortune 100 officer. There's only 500 Fortune 100 officers in the world. In the world. Well, I want to be in that category. I want to be you know, in that network or even Fortune 1000 officers in the world. So when you think of it like that, you like that positioning. Positioning is good. And that also, by the way, helps you get more interviews, gets you the kind of interviews you want and where you want to go. And by the way, on, sorry, David, you get, you put the quarter in, you get to go for the full ride. So I'm Love it. popped up on coffee and everything else. But in terms of interviewing your clients, not everybody will do that. I don't interview my clients, for instance, people I'm, trying, I'm interviewing for a purpose of trying to tell the story of how you use content to market your business. That's what I primarily do with all business and has been the theme. Although most people don't know that's really the theme other than by getting it over and over and over. You know, I'm asking them how they're using content. How do you market the company? What's the ways you do that? You know, the business of the business. That's what I always try to focus on. But for most people that are doing a podcast, and we know a lot of them that are thought leaders, that's what you want to do. You want to try to find people that you can do business with and find a purpose for your podcast other than just making noise. Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. Talk a little bit about what you recommend podcast hosts do before the interview, during the interview, and after the interview that would allow them to pivot to a, hey, maybe we can do business together kind of conversation. Uh, First of all, you got to get real good about saying things like, hey, when I was speaking at a convention and this person happens to be the CEO of a franchise operation, he now knows that you keno. Or in my book, I say this, you say this, how does that compare, right? Now I've told him I'm an author. Or when I'm consulting to companies like yours that do this, that's another way you can do it. I mean, these are the things that you work into the saying you're selling without selling. So you're able to just, you know, genuinely do that. That's going to come through. What are you doing afterwards? Are you handing them a gift? Are you sending them a book? Are you saying, hey, David, that was such a great interview. I learned so much about your company. Not only do I want to send you a book, but can I have your permission to send a signed book to every single one of your staff, your direct reporting staff in the C-suite, right? Boom. There's another one, right? There's lots of things that you can do that you can follow up. Those are just very, to me, one-on-one steps that you should be doing, right? And then you want to follow up and send them articles, send them, you know, maybe gifts, things that you see that go on throughout the year. And and it's a nurturing process. So it's not just, you know, slam, bam, and it's over. It's a process that you're building a relationship. And so at the levels that I do, could I typically only like to interview companies that are billion dollars or greater, iconic in size, have followers of at least 100,000, or just find them to be damn interesting and I want them on the show. And so based on that criteria, I always follow up. I'm building a relationship with them, you know, and I put them together with so-and-so and and -and so-and-so, and and maybe you'd like to know this one or that. So I'm constantly doing those things. It was amazing. I, I just looked at my roughly 800 episodes or so that I have and looked at every single, you know, guest that I have done. And I'm just like blown away by these people that I've had on the show. I'm still like in awe 
And then I'm going back and saying, okay, now it's time to be a sponsor. Would you like to do this? Would you, you know, can we connect again? And I give every one of those executives a free membership into my organization too, right? Well, let's talk about that. So what is, and I know you have a couple of different membership type yes. of opportunities for folks. Talk about what that looks like on the C-suite side. Talk about what that looks like on the Hero Club side. Okay, that's a great, thank you for that question. So first of all, everybody comes in as an executive member. You're going to be an insider, which you just sign up and that's for free and you get access to certain content and information and notices of what's going on. And then you can be an executive member, which is the basic level inside our organization. And then you can sign up for other subscriptions for content or other services that you might like to have, like the Hero Club, which is a a mastermind or a peer-to-peer council for value-based CEOs. You could do that for our thought council, which is for the you know top thought leaders in the world. And what we do is we work on growing our business. You could be part of the mastermind council. You could be part of leadership council. You could be part of the women's coaches council. You could be part of lots of different subscription-based services and also things like C-suite radio, C-suite TV. You can get C-suite publishing if you want to do a new book. You want to make it a bestseller. If you want to get a ghostwriter, you need a publisher, you need PR support. All of those subscription services are available. And then we have lots more like C-Suite Loan and C-Suite Legal. We got the ERC tax credit that we're doing, C-Suite ERC tax credit. So there's lots of other services that you can sign up that are either benefits and or for fee subscription. Wow, wow, wow. But all of of them is about, David, really, truly connecting people together so you have a little education, motivation, inspiration, and a chance at some monetization, you know, depending on what you're doing or how you're serving it. And then really, truly, our job is not to make you the smartest person in the room because you're already there, but to make you the most strategic person in the room. And so that's what we try to do is open it up by making sure that people have access to content that will grow their lives, their knowledge, and their business. And that's really, truly what we do. Let me pivot to like the superhero level of this, because I've heard you speak on this and I know that you are masterful at helping others do this too, strategically thinking about it. Board positions. Yeah. You say, you know what? I love getting paid big dollars for keynoting. I love when people come into my various programs, but I want to be on boards. I want to be on boards. And you're on a number of amazing boards. 14 today, three of them publicly traded companies. I just cashed out of one for multi millions of dollars that went public for 20 some billion bucks. And I've, you know, my, I rolled all my work into stock. Yeah. And I'm meeting with right after we get done with this call, I'm going to put on some jeans, my cowboy boots, and go downstairs and meet in the lobby with another CEO of a new startup to talk about being on their board. We're just going to back up the truck for a quick second. It's going to sound like this beep, (laughs) beep, beep. People like, wait a minute. I'm a thought leader. I'm a consultant. I'm an expert. I'm a CEO. I can be on boards. That never even occurred to me to be on boards. So walk us through board service 101 for the folks that are listening that have never even thought of this. What are some steps that they can start to think about of how to get their first board seat? Well, so first of all, you have to let people know that you're available. So when I'm speaking at the Intel Investors Conference and there's, you know, 1,200 CEOs and 1,200 other, you know, second officers and and advisors to companies, you're making mention of the fact that on this board that I'm on, this is what happened and how we did this, right? Now they know, oh, he serves on board. I should ask him to serve on a board. So because I want every speech I want to leave with, geez, do I want to hire him for a speaker, right? Second, do I want to follow him or have some content that's worthwhile that I want to follow him? So I give him that opportunity. Third, I want them to say, do I want to hire this guy as a consultant of some kind? And fourth, might I get a board offering of some kind? So that's what I come out of every keynote wanting to do to make sure that when I step off stage, 20, 30 people come swarm me after the stage. So I'm taking their cards, writing board, writing those things. So first of all, are you geared towards the message of that you can do this? That's number one. And if you're not asking, you're not getting, okay? Because nobody just comes out of the blue and just goes, oh, I need a board member and who should it be? And oh, and then they think of you. No, you have to market it and sell it. Or you have to have a great network of other people who say, Jeff, come serve on this board with me. Or, or, hey, we read this one, come serve over here. 
or that connection. So that's number one. Second, you want to be able to understand what is your duties when you're on that board, right? What's it mean to be a board member? It's not means that you're going to have to do something. To get something, you have to do something. So, you know, I always make sure I'm always chairman of the comp committees because I want to oversee the comp for the officers of the company. That puts me in tight with the leadership of the company. I hate, I hate to be on the compliance committee or the government, you know, I don't want any of that stuff. And by the way, I typically serve like on four of those companies as chairman of the board. That means I've worked my way up and done my duty and really have paid my dues. The other thing is what value you bring. What are the things that you can list out of the value you bring? If it's a young startup company, what are they going to want, David, more than anything? Marketing and sales. Yeah, marketing, sales, and money. They want money. So they want marketing, sales, or they want investors. So what's my link to other investors? So I just went on the board the other day. Literally within 15 days at board, I helped raise them about 4 million bucks. So that was through two phone calls, right? Then I put the right people together, said to the CEO of that company, you fly down, you be in Dallas on Friday. I'm going to be at this event. I'm going to introduce you to a couple people. I think they'll invest in your company, get your butt down there. Of course, he's saying, oh, I don't know. I said, look, you're in or you're out. And so you know, they need to understand that you can deliver and so forth. So what are you going on that board for? Because you're going on to do something. So understand the commitment. And then, you know, what's your compensation? You're going to have to get a look at, you know, understanding what some of those things are. How much do you get any shares? What do those shares look like? Are they A class, C class, B class, C class? Are they, you know, pre-val, post-val warrants? What, you know, all those kinds of things you have to think about. And then, you know, you just don't think you're going to get paid right away because that's, unless it's a publicly traded company that's been established, you're not getting paid right away. So well, that's what I was going to ask next yeah. is that there are paid board positions, obviously, yeah. at a higher level. And there's also unpaid board positions. Is that where most folks should start when they're totally, putting their yeah, go in? Yeah, the startups. I mean, listen, I had a little startup called DocuSign, you know, that I worked on, worked my way through and did and helped and so forth. And that paid off. I've got a number of those that have paid off. Maybe it's a hundred thousand. Maybe it's a lot bigger number. Maybe it's nothing. I lost my ass and didn't get anything. OK, I've got a long list of those, too. But for me, I have my boards is like a business now for me. So I have a person who manages my board commitments, manages my to do's on it. We have Monday board, you know, and for each company of what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do it because I'm using my celebrity, I'm using my expertise, I'm using my IP to leverage for maximum effect my earning potential based on being a board member. Okay. And you bet I'm using it. You know, it's like the company I'm going to talk to today. They need me because my validation of them in the marketing arena with major companies that you would use this company. I'm not going to say what it is. There's value to that. Okay. And so if you think I'm coming to do it just for stock, they ain't happening on this particular board. So what is it that, you know, you can pay in terms of a fee consulting or whatever? Now, if you're in a publicly traded company, that becomes a problem. If you're serving on the board and still and doing business with the company, there are some conflicts with that. And so is it at a level of which could be, a you know, like we I'll give you a good example. Michael Hawley, who is no longer alive, used to be at MIT. And then he also owned the EG conference, was on the board of Kodak. And so we were a sponsor of the EG conference. So we're paying him a couple hundred thousand dollars a year plus stock to be on the board, plus so much a meeting. And we're picking him up with a private jet. And at the same time, I'm spending X hundreds of thousands of dollars on his conference. Now, is that a conflict? Well, you know, those are the things that I have to sit down with the attorney and determine when I was the chief marketing officer, whether that or not was a conflict. And I've got other boards that I've been on where I, you know, I had the, I owned a PR marketing firm. We were doing business with them and then they asked me to serve on the board. Sometimes I had to give those services up to serve on the board. And then, by the way, there's some downsides to this too, David, right? You can get sued. And if you're going to be on a board, especially a publicly traded company, you're going to get sued. Whether you like it or not it has nothing to do with you or your actions or whether you're ethical or unethical. And I'm assuming most people are ethical. Most people don't wake up every morning and say, I can't wait to be sued or I can't wait to break the law. By and large, I find most people to be really good. So, but you just, that's the nature of the game. That's that pesky fiduciary responsibility clause when you're a board, board. member. Yep. Yep. And by the way, I've you know been on a board where we went against the chairman because of what he was trying to do. 
majority of us, three of us out of the five, felt that what he was doing was inappropriate. So we challenged him. We became somewhat hostile in the in the the arrangement, but we've you know suspended our pay. In the end, we lost all of our stock. Company did the right thing and so forth. We got sued as part of the process because the shareholders were suing the whole company, even though we the shareholders loved what we were doing because we were giving them back a maximum value because the chairman of the time was really trying to steal the company underhandedly and didn't put it out for bids and what we consider some consider underhandedly. And then, you know, we ended up in the front page of the paper, you know, the Wall Street Journal. Why three of five board members resigned or not resigned, but went hostile. And two of those guys used to work for the chairman, you know, so it's like, whoa. So that tells you something. And then, but in the end, we were found to do it right. And, you know, my wife says, why are you doing this? You're not getting paid. You're getting sued. We're going to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars because our stock is going to, you know, we have to give up the stock. And I said, just what good people do, right? Because that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you signed up for. That's the tough part of board service, not just the glamorous, fun, profitable part. Yep. Yeah. Go, you're waking up at two or three o'clock in the morning in Ireland when you're on vacation and doing a five hour board call. Right. And then can't even go back to bed because your family's getting up and wants to go out and you've got a quick shower and join them for breakfast and then head out for the day. That's the stuff you have to do. Right. Let's shift gears because one of the other hats that you wear, in addition to your cowboy hat, is you are a very busy, very popular, and Hall of Fame speaker. So talk to us about the speaking landscape in this current environment, kind of this post-pandemic world. I know you're jet-setting all over the place. Talk about where the speaker marketplace is now emerging into, and then what you see for the next little bit of time as far as paid speaking as a profit center for experts, or for CEOs for that matter. I think the paid speaking is going to be less and less. It's going to be haves and have nots. So you're either going to have to be a celebrity and an expert at the highest level, right? So that you're a household name in that genre, vertical, whatever, or you're a big ass name, right? So you're a brand upon yourself. So that's what it's going to go to. And those that don't have it, you I mean those speakers at that, what I would call the 7,500 range, the 10, 15,000 hour range. I think those are going to go by the wayside. They're going to look for speakers who bring something to the table and are a draw to fill the room. That's what I believe is where it's going. And you have to be of that level if you want to compete and make a living at it or make an impact on your business. That's one. Then there'll be the next level, which is the have nots, and they'll still do the Kiwanis clubs and the rotaries and the you know, the little in the high schools and that kind of stuff. And God bless you. And I'm not knocking you. We've all been there. We've done that. I'm just not doing that anymore unless it's my kid's high school or my grandkids high school or something like that. But I'm seeing the positioning of speaking, at least from my perspective, I'm doing less paid keynotes because I don't care anymore. Right. I'm using the keynotes or speeches that I do to leverage and drive the business that I have. Got it. So I'm more about how can I go on that stage and not get 25 or 35 for a thousand for a keynote, but how can I get a hundred thousand or 300,000 out of that event, out of that time that I'm on stage? That's what I'm using it for. And I'm finding that to be a lot better. I speak less, you know, because I used to be doing 200 and some keynotes a year, 300 at at a real heavy pace you know, good money. Let's be clear. It's good money. But now I'm doing it a lot smarter. And I think that's where we're going to be heading. I think what, you know, again, COVID showed us is that we could sit in a pair of shorts, wear a nice dress shirt and a jacket and do this and still do it very effectively and impact more people, right, than doing it on a stage at a place. You know, there was a million dollar speakers group meeting one time that I was on with, I think you were there. And one of the speakers said, I can't wait to get back on stage again. And everybody was like patting him on the back, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, gentlemen, ladies, I don't care if I ever walk on another stage the rest of my life. Because again, shifting model of how can I impact and get to the revenues of the things that I want and drive the business that I want to have rather than what I was participating in the past. Not knocking it for those that want to do it and so forth. It's not a criticism. It's just a realization of understanding the models are different. For sure. Absolutely. And I love what you said at the top of our 
interview where we don't identify ourselves as a speaker or a coach or a consultant or a podcast host. Those are simply distribution methods yeah. for our expertise. And as the model starts to shift, where you get monetization starts to shift also. Titles. I like titles and I don't like titles because titles are the things that separate us, but titles are also the things that bind us. I'm starting to work with a young women's leadership organization to realize that titles are very important in that regard. And so these things, author, speaker, coach, you know, trainer, those are all just titles that help to identify, but don't make up really who we are and what our IP is. And so we should look at our work as a collective and saying that, you know, I want to be known as the person who does this, right? You know, that's what I want to have. And so my collective is what it is, but the titles are important, you know, Young women grow to, you know, when they're first born, they become little girls and then they grow into young women and they start being students and Girl Scouts and brownies and, and later class presidents and valedictorians and cheerleaders and basketball players and, and a whole host of things. And, you know, I, I just want to help people with their titles as much as possible to get whatever title you want in the way that you feel you've deserved or earned. And I think that's an awesome way to do it. Yes, I know. Terrific episode here. But have you seen our latest web training? Oh, my goodness. Pop over there right now. Or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there. Back to the good stuff. Let's go back because you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I think people may have a different idea of it. Content. Content yep. as a marketing tool, content as a sales platform. Your content is always edgy, personal, humorous, contrarian, a little bit provocative. A lot of people are afraid to be like you and I in that way, right? We're calling out BS. Yeah. Well, you do, you do the same thing. I mean, you're very much the same. You, you might even be better looking than me. So on the camera side, it's just better. <laughs> but you know, but they, we should be who we are. And by the way, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be me. And so that's me. I'm, in, I'm inquisitive. I like to think I'm fairly intelligent. I like to think I'm funny. I like to think that, you know, I'm the kind of person you'd like to have for dinner and, you'd, and the person you'd love to watch your grandkids. You know what I mean? I want to be that kind of person. And so I don't want to be anything else than I am. And I do see people who put on a show. And you see this in marketing. You know, deep down, they're shallow. It just it doesn't fit. But also even their websites, their websites look like they're billion dollar brands, but they can't even afford to pay the person that just designed the website. You know, so I think it's important to have content that reflects who you genuinely, truly are, period. End of story. And by the way, it'll eventually come out anyway. You know, we'll figure that out. We'll figure out that your website's bullshit. We'll figure out your services. Oh, you want to be a life coach? You're 19 years old. You can't be a life coach when you're 19. You're a teen coach. Let's be very clear. So, you know, the, your credentials it won't live up to the hype, you know, of what you are. But again, I want to separate. I want to be this, not this, right? And so that's what thought leaders do. Thought leaders have haters. Thought leaders have people who quote them. Thought leaders are provocative. They're written about. They're, you know, again, they're quoted. They're, there's all kinds of Randy Gage actually did a great article once or and speech at a million dollar speakers group where he outlined what a thought leader was. He, he probably gave 20 or 30 points. And I've, I've actually stolen that with his permission and showed it to people because I just thought it was probably the best example of how to be a thought leader. Didn't agree with him on all things, but that's the purpose of being a thought leader. You know? right. That's cool. Right. You know, so but he did a great job on that. I love that. So content as a visibility tool, content as a credibility tool, and content as a channel through which you can communicate your authentic personality, your authentic insights, what you believe in, what you don't believe in, what's right with the world, what's wrong with the world. Is that the kind of content that gets attention? Yeah. I, well, I think genuine content gets attention. You know, fake content gets attention, but doesn't last. Genuine content lasts over steady eddies, lasts over a long period of time, period. So, you know, the more you do it over a longer period of time, more you're going to get noticed. So you have to do it and you have to be where the people are. You know, Sam Kennison used to do this routine where he, he talked about people living in a desert. He said, you're starving. Well, you freaking live in a desert. Move to where the food is. So when it comes to content, you know, you have to go to where the food is. So you might not use TikTok. You know, I don't use TikTok, but you got to be on it. You might not be an Instagram. I could care less sometimes about all that stuff, but I got to be on it, right? 
So you have to go where the people are and just notice that that, you know, and you don't always have to. You can do whatever you want to do. Doesn't mean it's right or it's wrong, but it's your way. And I respect that, too. I tell people all the time, you know, because a lot of times you become a speaker and they say, oh, you must do this. You got to have a scissor reel. You got to have this. You You don't need all that crap. If there's video out there, content about you, they can see who you are and what you're about. So you don't need to do all these things that people say you do. It just makes them feel better about themselves that they spent all the money that they said they were supposed to do. Right, right. Awesome. Well, as we're wrapping up, I've got two final questions for you. The final, final question is how can people get connected and stay connected to you? The second, the last question, if folks were to take one overarching concept from our conversation today about the state of the entrepreneurial expert, what would you say is the big takeaway you'd like them to have? Content, content, content. You have to become a media business. If you're a dry cleaner in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you have to be known as the king of spots or the queen of spots, that you're the doctor of fixing people's you know, gravy stains, whatever it is, not just that you're the dry cleaner on the corner, who cares? That's part of the pack. But if you become the content king or queen, and get that out and activate it, people will drive across town to you. And if you're that is a thought leader or that is a major corporation, the same thing applies is just z- bigger zeros behind the numbers in terms of the impact that you can have with the customer base that you want to serve. So content, content, content. You got to be a media company. My new moniker is Dr. Gravy Stain. I'm going <laughs> to own it. I'm going to own it, my I, friend. I, I might already have that trademarked. I don't know. We'll yeah, see. it could be. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll have to be careful and look that up. Yeah. Tell people how can they get connected and stay oh, connected nice. to more Jeffrey Hazlett brilliance. Where can we send people? What links do you want to share? Hey, just come over to c-suitenetwork.com, c-suitenetwork.com, C-Suite TV, C-Suite Radio, C-Suite Publishing, C-Suite Loans, whatever you want to do. But C-Suite Network is the best place to find us. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. And it's all Jeffrey Hazlett. Always has been, always will. Awesome. Well, Jeffrey Hazlett, you are a rock star. I appreciate you. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you, my friend. wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.